All right. Um, so my message today is uh, Surrendering to God as King. That's the title of my message. Uh, just to give you um, a review, this is the fourth message. The first one was out of Psalm 24, uh, Psalm 15, Isaiah 33, Malachi 3. And the question was, whom may ascend the hill of the Lord? And we talked about holiness and fear of the Lord in that message. And um, we, we have a sense that as the spring season draws to a close, um, that God's pruning process, the fear of the Lord, the rebuilding of the altar, there's going to be a shift taking place and that God's glory is going to come in. So I, I'm continuing to sow into that. There's a number of more messages uh, related to this altar series. Uh, the next message was I talked about the significance of the altar and the priority of repentance related to that. And just to remind you, since I, a number of you said it was really great to hear this new concept, uh, sort of concept, um, the altar is a place of encounter, God to man. Anytime there was an encounter in scripture, a covenant made, God intervening, God coming down, Jacob's ladder, Abraham, you know, meeting the Lord in covenant uh, through the pieces, he would build, he would build an altar in that place. And it's a place of sacrifice, provision for, for sin, consecration, thanksgiving, intercession, and covenant making where the people of God surrender to God. And it was beautiful in worship today to just keep singing and saying, we surrender to you as king. We surrender to you as king. Repentance being the first step in the altar of worship. Last week, we talked about the priority of rebuilding the altar first, then the temple where God's presence dwells, and finally the wall. So we're starting with this idea of the glory coming to our city, which was declared in that prophetic word um, from Lori this morning. We're starting with the altar, and my concern is that we do enough work on the altar that I really feel like we're settled with that. Then the presence will come, his glory will come in, and then the city will be touched. It's that order, the altar was first. And um, then we talked, as we closed last week's message about the principles of breakthrough, how when heaven has a decree issued, breakthrough happens on earth. And we had eight principles around that. You can go uh, two places um, uh, to catch these things. We, we're not quite ready on the podcast, but on our website, you have uh, audio messages and video of our, all our sermons for several years. And you can see these, there'll be uh, four messages after today, this will be the fourth. You can re-listen to any of those if you want. And then on peteryoungministries.com, we've got a podcast series, we've got the Joshua series is about to be loaded uh, there in, in entirety. I've, I've got um, about 25 messages of kingdom ministry training. So if you're not in the class, you can actually go listen to podcasts of all the teaching of kingdom ministry as well. So, um, all right, so here we go, rebuilding the altar of worship. And again, I titled it today, Surrendering to God as King. Um, in the church calendar, this is Palm Sunday, and I'm gonna be reading out of Matthew 21 and Luke 19. So let me turn there uh, to just get those passages open in front of me. Let me read the text. I'm gonna read both of them to you and then draw some principles uh, before we... Um, continue to declare God as king in our lives. Um, this is uh, called the triumphal entry in some of your Bibles. It's when Jesus, the reason it's called that, this is a procession that establishes the coronation of a king. And we sang about Jesus being king today. And I just want you to listen to this. I'll unpack both texts in just a minute. Uh, but I'm gonna go all the way through Jesus cleansing the temple. Matthew 21, verse one. I'm in the New King James now, when they drew near Jerusalem and came to Beth, Bethage at the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, go into the village opposite you and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them to me. And if anyone says to you, you shall say to them, the Lord has need of them and immediately he will send them. All this was done to, that it might be fulfilled what was spoken by the prophet, and this would be prophet Zechariah in Zechariah um, chapter uh, 9, um, verse 9 and 10. It says, um, 
Tell the daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming to you lowly and sitting on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. So the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them. They brought the donkey and the colt, laid their clothes on them, and set him, that would be Jesus, on them. And a very great multitude spread their clothes on the road. Others cut down branches from trees and spread them on the road. Then the multitudes who went before and those who followed cried out, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna is a, a word which, uh, from Hoshana, which means Lord save us or Lord bless us right now. Um, and when they had come in Jerusalem, all of the city was moved. Uh, who is this, they declared. So the multitude said, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth of Galilee. Then Jesus went into the temple of God and drove out all those who bought and sold in the temple and overturned the tables of money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. The reason he did this, by the way, is they charged exorbitant prices. They marked it up. Uh, what would have cost a dollar was probably being sold for $20. And, and they also marked up the, the, the coinage of the temple was different than the common coinage of the people. So they had to change their money to actually get the coinage of the temple. And they charged exorbitant fees for the cha transfer of those, those funds. And then in addition, they charged too much for the offerings. And so people were excluded from making offerings because they could not afford to do so because of the injustice and usury in the temple, courts of the Gentiles, the courts of the nations. Um, so it says, uh, and then he said to them, it's written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you've made it a den of thieves. Then the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. But when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things he did and the children crying out in the temple saying, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant and said to him, do you hear what they're saying? And Jesus said to them, yes, have you never read out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants you have perfected praise? And he left them and went out into the city of Bethany and he lodged there. Now let me read the text in Luke, it's very similar. But there's a couple of additional things. It starts in verse 28 of chapter 19 in Luke. Um, and it came to pass when Jesus drew near to Bethage and Bethany on the Mount of Olivet, which is the Mount of Olives, that he sent two disciples saying, go into the village opposite you. And there you will enter and find a colt tied or tethered, which no one has ever sat. That's new information. Loose it and bring it here. And if anyone asks you, why are you loosing this tethered colt? That you shall say, because the Lord has need of it. So those who were sent went their way and found it just as he said to them. But as they were loosing the colt, the owners of it said, why are you loosing the colt? And he said, the Lord has need of him. And they brought him to Jesus. They brought, um, and they threw on their own clothes on the colt and they set Jesus on him. And as he went, many spread their clothes on the road. And he would, as he was drawing near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen. So they're declaring his miracles. And they say, blessed is the king. They've got new language here. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And the same Pharisees came to him, or excuse me, and some of the Pharisees from the crowd, teacher, rebuke your disciples. But he answered them and said, I tell you that if these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. And as he drew near the city, he wept over it saying, if you had known even you, especially in this your day, the things that make for your peace, your wholeness, your healing, but now they are hidden from your eyes, for days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you, surround you and close you in on every side and level you and your children within you to the ground. And they will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not know the time of your visitation. This is prophesying 
the, the uh, destruction of the temple in 70 AD, and this happened just as Jesus prophesied. And then he goes into the temple, like we had in Matthew, went into the temple, began to drive out those who brought and sold in them, saying, it is written, my house is a house of prayer, but you've made it a den of thieves. So let me draw a couple of things I want to draw out of these two texts, and I'll be flipped back between the two. The first thing I want to say, there's, there's actually five things, if I have time, um, we'll just kind of see where we're at. We started a little late, but I'll do the best I can to fly through this. Um, there's five things I want you to catch, so I'm going to review them with you before I actually hit them. Um, Jesus is presenting himself as the prophet that Moses foreshadowed and the Messiah that the Old Testament spoke of. So he's, he's declaring himself to be both the prophet and the Messiah. The second thing that I'm going to talk about is the people actually proclaim through their words, which we just had read, that he is the prophesied Messiah King. And then thirdly, he's actually accepting their praise as the Messiah when he says the rocks will cry out. Surely, you know, uh, even children out of the mouth of children, you know, God has ordained highest praise. And then he weeps over the city because he recognizes they are going to reject him and they will, as a result, have judgment come upon them. And then fifthly, when he comes in, he cleanses the temple. So let's unpack these each first. Um, Jesus presents himself as the promised Messiah and the prophet. The Messiah in in, uh, Jewish writings was a uh, prophet, priest, king that was to come with the full anointing of the Holy Spirit to uh, bring um, heaven's salvation to earth. Uh, It was uh, gonna be God's servant, the son of God that was gonna take the sins of the world on his back was going to come in, but also was going to be a conquering king. So in all of the Old Testament texts, when you read about uh, Jesus coming in, you'll have passages like that one in Zechariah where upon the colt, uh, even the foal of a colt, he will ride in. Right after that, it says, and then the war horses will be defeated. And it talks about Christ's second coming and the defeat when Jesus comes back with a white horse to defeat enemies. It's in two verses, nine and 10 of Zechariah, just parallel each other. But the first one is the first coming. The second one, when he comes as conquering king, is his second coming. So we're focused on the first coming this time, but the idea here was um, the Jewish people were under Roman rule and they were concerned. Their, mo- their main thought was kick out the Romans so that we might have our kingdom again under the rulership of the Lord, we might have freedom to do all that we want to do as a kingdom. And they didn't realize that Jesus actually came to set aside the Old Testament tradition and to reestablish a new covenant in his blood through the cross and the resurrection. By the way, this picture, I got a text of what it means. Let me uh, read it to you. You obviously can see that celebration of new life coming out of the tomb Uh, Let me read it. Somebody texted me what it was. Thank you, Lori. Um, Where did it come through? With me and John. John. Thank you. I can't have had that many notes. Here it is, John and Michael. Okay. Um, Let's pull it up. Oh, come on. It's on its side. Um, I saw a powerful kingdom wind being released in the resurrection season. A wind that comes in suddenly, the Holy Spirit wind that moves where he wants and is changing lives and atmospheres. It inhabits the praise of his people and the praises of their lips causes increase to the power of the wind. Acts 2, uh, verse 2, 11 and 19, John 3, 8 and Psalm 22, verse 3, which it says the Lord is enthroned on the praises of his people. So it's about the kingship of the Lord, the wind of the spirit, which Daniel prayed into coming. Thank you, Lori. Perfect painting uh, for today. Um, This week, by the way, that he came in, in triumphal was also the Passover week where Israel celebrated the deliverance from bondage in Egypt through mighty signs and wonders and brought into the promised land to meet with God as king 
And so they are celebrating Passover, and uh, at the same time, he's making a triumphal entry, declaring himself as king. So um, it says uh, here in um, this idea of prophet, I want to just give you an Old Testament uh, text about the prophet they were looking for. It's in Deuteronomy 18, verse 15 and 18. This is Moses saying, the Lord... Your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from amongst the fellow Israelites, and you must listen to that prophet. I will raise up a prophet like you from among the fellow Israelites. I will tell the prophet what to say, and he will tell the people everything I command him. This is the Lord speaking. So this prophet that is to come is going to declare only what the Lord is speaking and tell the people, and he will be one of the people. Jesus was God and he was man, he was one of them. And it says in the New Testament that he only did what he saw the Father doing and he only spoke what the Father told him to speak and he did not speak on his own initiative. So when John the Baptist was asked, are you the prophet? He said, no, but there is one that's coming. Jesus was that prophet that declares what the Father is saying to the people. So that's why in that text in Matthew, it said, this is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth that is to come. They were actually reinforcing that this is the prophet that the Old Testament foreshadowed that would declare the words of the Father and only speak on the Father's initiative. The issue of the Messiah was already on the people's mind. They expected the Messiah to come in and they expected him to come in three ways. Um, the, the presence of God and the Messiah was understood to come from the Mount of Olives in the Old Testament. So what happened in the Old Testament is in Ezekiel 11, um, it says Ezekiel has a vision. This is when the nation is being taken captive because they have sinned against the Lord. They are taken captive and it says the glory of the Lord lifted from the temple on Mount Sion, Zion, where the temple was and hovered over the mountain to the east, which is the Mount of Olives, and then ascended to heaven. And so the glory left Israel from the Mount of Olives. And it, that, was, uh, that was Isaiah eleven twenty three, And then Ezekiel has a further vision and sees the glory of the Lord coming back when the millennial temple is being established. And by the way, the millennial temple, the gates had palm branches and palm tree leaves on it. And they had one with a lion's face looking at one palm tree. All of the steps had palm trees. You can read it in Ezekiel 41, uh, Ezekiel 40 about the, the, the millennial temple, which is a picture of Christ's reign on the earth, and it's decorated with palms. That's why they wave palm branches. So he comes from them, and it says there in Ezekiel 43.1, that the glory will re-enter Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives just as it had left. So Jesus is going to come into Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives, the glory of the Lord coming, open ye gates, you heavenly doors, that the King of glory might come in. And where did he ascend? He left and he, he went, and when he met with his disciples, he went to the Mount of Olives and he ascended from the top of the Mount of Olives. So the glory left until he returned. Where does Revelation say that he's returning? The Mount of Olives. He will return on the Mount of Olives and it's Revelation 7, 9 talks about when he comes, the people will be waving, they will be dressed in white and they will be waving palms. So you have this picture of the Messianic king from Mount Olives, so Jesus fulfills that. And it's, we actually know how they got palm branches. I've been in Israel, they don't have palms there. So I'm like, Lord, how did, how did they get palm branches? Like, seriously, it's only in Jericho. And so in Matthew 20, where two men received their sight, it says, now as they went out of Jericho, hello, the city of palms, a great multitude followed Jesus. And they follow him all the way up to Bethage and Bethany, and they're the ones coming before him into the city. The city's unaware of his arrival, but it's those that came up from the city of Palms that are waving the palm branches and laying them before him and putting their clothes down on the donkeys and on the path saying, this is our king. 
And everyone stirred and moved and shook. It actually, the word in Greek means they were shook to the core. Who is this that is being proclaimed king? So he came from the Mount of Olives. And interestingly, it said he, he went and got the tethered cult. Now, some of you may not know the prophecy in Genesis 49, 10 to 11. So let me turn there. This is... Um, What happened is Jacob gave blessing over all of his sons before he died and passed. Let's see here, 49 verse 10 and 11 is about Judah. I'll start in verse eight. This is Jesus, by the way, that's being prophesied to Judah. By the way, Judah means praise. Right, Joel, you should know this. Your son is is called Judah. Um, Judah... You are he whom your brothers shall praise. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. What does Jesus do to defeat Satan? Your father's children shall bow down before you because he's king of kings and lord of lords. Judah is a lion's whelp. Who is Jesus? The lion of the tribe of Judah. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He bows down and lies down as a lion. And as a lion, who shall rouse him? The scepter which speaks of rulership shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until the Shiloh comes. The Shiloh, to him whom the rulership belongs, comes. Shiloh being the place of the Lord's presence where the Lord rules as king. And to him shall be the obedience of the nations. And they said, uh, and it said, binding his donkey to the vine and the donkey's colt to the chosen vine. So what's happening is the, the colt is prophesied to be tethered. He washed his garments in white and his clothes in the blood of grapes. What does that speak of? The blood of Jesus, his sacrifice. So it was actually prophesied that there would be a colt tethered And it would be on that cult that this king, the ruler from Judah, from the scepter, that will not pass, the kingdom of which all would bow down, would actually ride in on a tethered cult. And that's all the way back in Genesis. Like, I don't know how many thousand years before Jesus did this. Boy, that's interesting stuff. The donkey, it said in Luke, had never been ridden. Why is that significant? Kings, well, religious animals that had not been yoked, like oxen, were the ones that were sacrificed because it was considered they could not be beasts of burden, but they had to be pure and never ridden on and tainted by sin. And so the king, when they had a donkey or a horse, They rode on one that had never been broken in as a sign of their kingship. So Jesus rides in on a a colt, and I'm just trying to picture this. Like, here's the Prince of Peace on a, if I remember my days, I was on a two-week horse trip over two different years um, where there was an unbroken horse, and they, they tend to kind of buck people off because they're not used to someone riding on their back So here we have a cult on which it's never been ridden. They don't even put a saddle on him. They just put clothes and they sit Jesus on him and he walks in peacefully into the city because the Prince of Peace is about to come in. And the cult is symbolic of uh, the king would ride in in peacetime on on a donkey, but in wartime on a horse. It's why he comes back the second time on a white horse, but he comes in on a donkey the first time because he's the Prince of Peace about to reestablish salvation on the earth. He He is the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and yet this time he's coming as the Prince of Peace and he's weeping over the city that will not receive him. So we have this tethered cult, and here's what, this is significant. By the way, David, when he anointed Solomon, said, take my colt and put Solomon on it and go down and anoint him at the spring of Gihon. That's where David came up the water shaft and took the city. And then let him come up from there. By the way, you would come up from there through the east gate. 
which is where Jesus came in on a, on a colt, on, a, on David's mule, to be anointed as king. So you have this picture. And Jehu, when Jehu became king, and it was suddenly they blew a trumpet and they took off their clothes and laid it before the king because it was a sign of we're in submission. We're in submission to this king. We're gonna lay down our cloaks to honor the fact that he is our king and we're honoring him as such. So you've got all these prophetic pictures about Jesus being the Messiah, Jesus being the king of what was prophesied in the Old Testament. And then he says, the Lord has need of your animal. He didn't say the son of man, which was his favorite title, has the need. He said the Lord. Now he's openly, by the way, you understand in your Bibles when you read the 7,000 sometimes that it's L-O-R-D in capital letters, that's the, the name Yahweh. And for the Jews, you could not pronounce the name Yahweh. So it was Jehovah or it was Yah, it was something else. And the name Yahweh means, you know, the, the best translation is um, the one who is the eternal existing one, the one who is, but when you look at it in context of Exodus 3 and Exodus 6, it says, until now you've known me as Elohim, the Lord Almighty, El Shaddai. But you've not known me by my personal covenant name, which is Yahweh, which is I will be who and what you need for you because that is my nature to be for you what you need. It's the personal name of God that says, I am coming for what you need. And Jesus is now going to say, the Lord, that's, he's identifying himself as the Lord. The Lord has need of this animal because I'm the king and I'm announcing myself as king. And I will fulfill Zechariah 9 and Genesis 49. And I am that scepter of the lion of tribe of Judah. And I'm riding in to take my place in the temple. So then, secondly, so the first thing we've said here is that through his prophetic acts, he's acknowledging he's the Messiah and he's the prophet. Then the people actually proclaim that. They do that by what we've already said. They place their cloaks down. That was the thing that you did to pay homage to a king. So part of what we're gonna do is we're gonna, this will be our cloak because I don't want anyone disrobing in church. And we're gonna put on these things. We've already put down what we are laying down to rebuild our altar, having our temple cleansed. And we're also going to write a word, and you could start with this if you'd like right now, of what does it look like? Like maybe a prayer of surrender. Like Daniel prayed, Lord, we surrender to you afresh as King of kings and Lord of lords. We are making you this day our king. And this picture of my paper says, you are my king and you will be that until you return. I am following you for life no matter what. And I am fully yielded, not my will, but your will be done. I honor you as my king. You are my Messiah. You are my prophet. You give me the words of heaven. You are the one who saves me. Hosanna, Hosanna, Lord save now. I will declare that and you are my king. So if you wanna write a prayer on there, you can do that as I keep talking. And so um, they fulfill this by declaring him that, and what they start singing is, um, let me read to you Zechariah 9.9. 9. Rejoice greatly, o, o daughter of Sion, Zion, Shout, daughter of Jerusalem, for your king comes to you righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. And then they spread their clothes out and um, they cut branches before him of palm trees. And we've talked about the significance. It is used, the palm branch was used in celebrations of the feast of booths, the tabernacle, God being with the people, as well as celebration of victory over enemies. By the way, Jesus on the cross defeated all of our enemies, defeated the works of the devil on the cross. 
And they also, um, this is the picture of what the, the millennial temple, which is in Jesus Christ, is decorated with, is the victory sign. And so this is what they were doing, and they started spreading these out as an act of submission. So then they actually shout praises to the Messiah, and this is in Psalm 118. Let me find it. You guys with me? We're okay? We're good? We're here? Okay. Psalm 118, I'm going to start in verse 14. Just listen to it. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. The Lord. Jesus has just announced himself as Lord. And they're singing out of this psalm. They all know what they're singing. This is understood by all of the Jewish rabbis of the day as a messianic song. The Lord is my strength and my song. He's become my salvation. The voice of rejoicing and salvation is in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. I shall die but live. Hello? I sh- oh, excuse me. Thank you. There, I should look at, I should read it up here. Do you need, do you see what Jesus? I shall not die, but shall live and declare the works of the Lord. The Lord has chastened me severely, but he's not given me over to death. Open to me the gates of righteousness and I will go through them. Oh my goodness. Yes, Lord, we open the gates of our heart. I, and I will praise the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord through which the righteous enter. I will praise you. How do they enter? Through our praises and our surrender and opening the gates of righteousness for the king of glory to come into our heart, into his temple and to do his work. I will praise you for you've answered me and you've become my salvation. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. When you built, you, you selected stones that were fitting for building something, an arch, the walls of something, and they looked at Jesus and said, that's not a fitting stone to build the temple of God. But Jesus said, wait a minute, the one you've rejected at the cross is the chief cornerstone that holds all of it together. Amen. This was the Lord's doing. It's marvelous in our eyes. This is the day The Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Save now, I pray, O Lord. There's Hosanna. O Lord, I pray, send now prosperity. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you from the house of the Lord. God is the Lord. He has given us light. Bind the sacrifice with cords to the horns of the altar. You are my God. I will praise you. You are my God. I will exalt you. I will give thanks to the Lord. For he is good and his mercy endures forever. They're singing that psalm as Jesus comes down the hill saying, you are that, Lord. Is that like powerful or what? The king of heaven, make way for the king of heaven for he's coming in. It's the soberness of the season. We're praying for the glory of the Lord and for revival Will we be qualified when he comes? Or do we have iniquity in our temple courts, personal temples? It's, a, it's an interesting picture right here. So they are shouting, Lord, you are our Messiah. And Jesus accepts their praise as the Messiah. Did you notice in the text? It said, if I don't accept the praise of the children. And if I don't accept the praise of the people as the Messiah, which I rightly am, even the rocks will cry out. When they rebuke, teacher rebuke them, they they don't know what they're doing. They're proclaiming you as king. They're proclaiming you as Messiah, as the prophet. This is not right. He says, the rocks will cry out if they don't. But it was the praise and celebration and the opening of the gates and the submission of heart, laying down the cloak, the palm branches to say, O King, be King of my heart. And we sang about it today. Thank you, Christy Joy and team. You guys did a wonderful job of like 
leading the way for the sermon. I, I, I didn't know what you were singing until I'd already decided on the sermon. And I'm like, okay, this is good. And then I want you to know that, notice, did, did you see Jesus wept over the city in Luke because he realized they were going to reject? I want to say this, Jesus, we heard a declarative word today that God is bringing justice with a ring, a signet ring. We'll do that in, in a guy chapter two in a couple of weeks. The signet ring, which the Rubable is going to have when the desire of the nations come in, is this picture of authority. And the Lord is saying, I, my authority is now being released to restore what was taken through injustice. And he's weeping over your prodigals, over some of your children or grandchildren that may not be following the Lord or may have rejected him, over churches that are not welcoming the presence, over a city like ours, which has no understanding, they're blind to the fact that God is coming back. And when he comes, he's coming to set things right and bring righteousness. And Jesus is weeping over our families, our hearts. We're out, out of alignment over those unrighteous, iniquitous things, over our city, over our state, over our nation. And that to me matters that the Lord's compassion is over us because that gives us the right to declare healing and to be as witnesses that the king is coming. It's actually time for the church to rise up and be the witnesses that the king is coming. What are we gonna do about it? And it's actually the king coming into his temple that is actually what will save a nation and a city and your household. That's why the altar's first and the temple second. And then the exterior things like the walls that build things is what follows. And I, I like this idea that lastly he cleansed the temple. We're the temple of the Holy Spirit. We're not to grieve the Holy Spirit or quench the Holy Spirit or resist the Holy Spirit or blaspheming the Holy Spirit, but rather we are to open the gates and allow the sanctifying work of the Word and the Spirit cleanse our hearts so the King of Glory might come in. Cleanse our hands. We learned some incredible thing at this conference seminar that was here with Becker Greenwood and uh, Jacob, or uh, Jared, Jareb with a B. He talked about the science of the neurons in the brain. You know, it talks about being transformed by the renewing of your mind, but they're the same ones in your heart. For out of the, the heart, the mouth speaks. And it's with the mouth that you confess and are saved. So what's actually happening with this is he needs to cleanse the temple of our hearts so that our outward hands are pure. And we're actually asking the Lord to come into our heart. May the king of glory come in so that we can rise up and be those righteous witnesses that it says in Isaiah 60, arise and shine for the glory of the Lord is upon you. For behold, deep darkness covers the peoples of the earth but the kings of the earth will come to the brightness of your dawn. You're arising. I'm not sure how to summarize this and apply it fully, except that um, I think what I wa want you to write on your card right now is I, I actually want you to give Jesus permission to cleanse your temple. <laughs> And I'm just gonna write for Bridgeway. I might as well do both. Where's my card? Oh, I can't lose my card. Maybe I did. That's all right. I'll write it on the back of announcements. Um, oh, that's good. I'm gonna, I'm gonna declare for Bridgeway that he has freedom to cleanse our temple and create alignment. Do this for your household. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna start putting it here. I wanted our worship team to participate in this, so I didn't have them come back up. You don't know this, but I picked a song on Thursday that I was gonna do for this thing, and it's the same thing. Uh, 
opening the gates for the king of heaven to come in. It's by Vineyard Music, it's, it's recent, it was done about a year ago. We're gonna play that in just a minute. For those of you watching us online, uh, because of copyright issues, we won't play it live, but you would just, what's it called? The King of Heaven. Um, let me see what it's called. I texted it to our tech folks. It is called The King of Heaven Live by Vineyard Worship. So you, you can watch what we're doing here by queuing that on Spotify, your Apple Music, or YouTube. It's on all three locations. And you can listen to the song. But... Um, I actually feel really sober about this, um, that what we're doing as a corporate act right now is we're giving the Lord access to the gates of your heart so that the king of glory, the king of righteousness might come in. We're acknowledging him as king. We've written, Lord, I want you to be king in this area. You might write a scenario, you might write a family member, you might write something that says, Lord, I need you to be king of this. I'm I'm surrendering that to you. I honor you and I praise you. And we're gonna put these down here and then I'm gonna have somebody strong take the King of Kings and Lord of Lords banner and we're gonna walk over the backs of the people because that was the picture prophetically that the King of Glory was coming to the front range in the Colorado and he was gonna walk over the backs of the saints. So when we put this down, we're, we're like doing this, right? It's I know this is kind of weird, but the prophets in the Old Testament did this, right? They put yokes on themselves and broke it. They laid on their sides for, you know, 365 days, you know, to do things. So it's called a prophetic act, and that's what we're doing. We're just going to lay this down before the Lord. And um, you all ready? Have you all had a chance to write? Let me write mine. Give me a minute. If you're crazy enough, join me in like a procession. I don't, who wants the honor of caring? Well, let me read that passage. Um, King of kings and Lord of lords. Let me, it's in Revelation. Let me just read it, just so you get a picture of what we're talking about. It has the verse on the back. Are you gonna carry it? Okay. Christ on a white horse. So we're actually foreshadowing his return on the Mount of Olives and the king coming in to our city, our region, and taking his rightful place as king. He did it 2,000 years ago, and here's what it reads. Now I saw heaven open, this is Revelation 19, verse 11, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. By the way, the same prophet that gave the word about this said the war in 24 is on the floor. The war in 24 is on the floor. <laughs> his eyes were like a flame of fire and on his head were many crowns and he had a name written on it which no one knew except himself. He was clothed in a robe dipped in blood and his name is called the word of God and the armies of heaven clothed in fine linen and white and clean followed him on a white horse. Is this just, uh, yeah. And it says, uh, and out of his mouth goes a sharp sword and with it he will strike the nations and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of the almighty God and he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And so... We're actually inviting the King of Kings and Lord of Lords into the room and into the house. And that's a sober word because it's, it's a place of the Lord returning for judgment and the Lord right now is weeping over those areas. There's a window. There's a window of salvation that the Lord is weeping over with his compassion and he's moved. And my prayer is the city will be moved as the King of Glory comes in. Revival's not about our programs, it's about the King of Glory. Okay, are we ready? So when you're ready, we're gonna have you come first and drop your piece of paper on the front as your prophetic act of saying, I am surrendering to the King as Lord, this is my garment, I'm inviting him in, and then I'm gonna play this song, The King of Heaven, 
We'll put the volume up and we're gonna march the banner through. So Kevin, why don't you go down here, down the aisle, around the back, back up like this aisle and we'll just keep moving that and you're welcome to join the procession. Why not let Jesus walk over these things and put righteousness over justice or injustice. Remember the foundation of his throne is righteousness and justice. And we're making, we're enthroning him today with our praises on this. Is this making sense? You guys good? All right, I haven't freaked you too much, too much out with a prophetic act. But so why don't we go ahead and do this? Um, you can put that music on softly. We'll just hit replay uh, when we do this. Um, those of you watching online, we're just gonna, you're gonna see us doing this. And you can play this song at home yourselves. And so... Yeah, turn it up just a smidge. Thank you. When you're ready, put your, lay your things at the front here. And then we're gonna take up that when it's all done, just lay it somewhere. And we're gonna let the king of glory come over these things. <laughs> 